we, we have a challenge for Adrian. He will try to explain us, is it really possible to have zero vulnerability container running? So over to you, and we'll be hitting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name's Adrian. I'm from a company called ChainGuard, and we basically do software supply chain security. And today, I will talk about how you can run with zero vulnerabilities. First, I'm going to have a quiz. And you all look scared now, so don't worry. This won't take long. Um, most of you, I think, are probably aware that uh, vulnerabilities are given like a CVE number. So I'm going to give you some CVE numbers, and I want you to tell me what the vulnerability was. So I'm going to say like CVE 2014-0160, and you're all going to shout Heartbleed, right? Yeah, you got it. Um, yeah, so please show out if you know any of the answers. I will give you a few clues and stuff, don't worry. So the first one we have is CVE 2017-5638. Does anybody know which application framework this was a vulnerability in? And for bonus points, and it's a bit of a clue, what famous data breach was it involved in? Do you know it? No, yeah, well done. Okay. Whoa, I didn't expect anybody to get that. <laughs> Apache, oh yeah, it's a remote code execution in Apache Struts. Uh, if you don't know, Apache Struts is a Java MVC framework, um, and basically it allowed remote code execution via HTTP headers. So that made it kind of really easy for hackers to scan the internet for vulnerable systems and exploit them. Now, the main reason that I mention this is because it was part of the Equifax data breach. And the Equifax data breach was like released finan private financial data of, of almost 150 million US citizens and 15 million UK citizens. And I think there was a few Canadians as well, but less for some reason. Um, it was one of the largest data breaches in history. Um, the CVE itself was a zero day, but the Equifax hack didn't start until five days after uh, there was a patch released. So theoretically, at least, Equifax could have patched their systems uh, and avoided this exploit. OK, CVE 2022-0847. Uh, this is a CVE that's big enough to get its own name. So can anybody tell me the name or what it was a vulnerability in? So it's a vulnerability in a very key piece of software. Any ideas? Sorry? No. It's 2022. Kernel? Yeah. It was a kernel vulnerability. Do you know the name of it? Sorry? No, the name of the, this was given, like the vulnerability itself was given a name. It's okay. It was Dirty Pipe. Um, yeah, so this was very similar to, the, I think it was called Dirty Pipe, because can you remember the Dirty Cow vulnerability? I think that was years and years ago. So I think it was kind of named after that, because it had a similar sort of impact. You could write to read-only files. Now, on the face of it, that doesn't actually sound that bad, but in reality, it is bad, because you can create, like, a, you know, you can basically give yourself super use of privileges and read things you shouldn't read, etc. So it's typically used as a privilege, privilege escalation exploit. And also, apparently, it affected lots of Android phones. OK, this is the big one um, that you are going to get. Does anybody know CVE 2021-44-228? This was, gave a lot of organizations a very bad out. Yeah, it's Log4J. Or Log4Shell, I guess, is the name of the exploit. But it was in Log4J. This has been described as the biggest single biggest, most critical vulnerability ever, which is a pretty bold claim. Um, but Log4J software was, and is, I guess, so prevalent that all large organizations were running it somewhere. And it meant that you know, millions of ops and security staff across thousands of organizations had a very bad week or weeks trying to identify and mitigate all applications that were running Log4J somewhere. And millions of devices were affected. There's a lot of IoT software, such as TVs and so on, turned out to be running Log4J. And my point of all this is that vulnerabilities are pretty bad, right? They get you hacked. They get cost organizations millions and reputational loss, also lawsuits, ransomware, and it goes on. It's 
vulnerabilities can end up being a very bad day. So in this talk, we're going to be talking about vulnerabilities and how they relate to containers and container images. Now, most of you you're at this conference are assuming everybody knows what containers are, but have most of you use vulnerability scanners? You know, like Privy and Gripe and Sneak and so on? I know you know Sneak. Um, cool, I think it's most people. So vulnerability scanners take images, make a list of all the software inside them and the versions, so kind of like an S-bomb, and then compare that to various security databases and return a list of any known vulnerabilities. And on the face of it, this sounds great, because I can scan my software, find the vulnerabilities, fix them, and push to production vulnerability free. Or at least that's a theory. But, yeah, it sounds like most of you have played with a vulnerability scanner, so you will know this is not the way things go. There's a bit of a problem. And the problem is, lots of images have vulnerabilities. Like this is running Docker Scout. So Docker Scout is quite a nice um, scanner. And the reason I use it is it gives quite nice um, output that I can use in slides and stuff. But if I run Docker Scout on the Nginx image, I get 40 vulnerabilities across 23 packages. And it's not really anything you can do about it. Like that's the official image. It's up to date. And that's what you get. Uh, the node one's worse. Um, in Docker Scout, I think it finds 90 vulnerabilities across 33 packages. You run it with Gripe, you get a lot more. I'm not quite sure of the difference. I'm slightly thinking Docker Scout might be more accurate. I'm not sure. Um, but the point is that you end up with like a whole list of CVEs in the image. So by the way, both those scans I did yesterday, so it should be exactly the same results today. Um, but you know, you get it's just this huge list of CVEs that you know it's hard to do anything with and hard to figure out even if they affect you at all. Because the majority of them aren't going to be exploitable. But which ones are? I don't know. And I think a lot of people get to the stage and kind of give up, or at least end up with suboptimal results. So you know, I've heard of like security teams trying to investigate all the vulnerabilities and send in images back to developers with instructions to get rid of the vulnerabilities or certify that they can't be exploited. And platform teams providing base images that already have so many vulnerabilities that nobody notices the extra ones in the application. And then other people spend so long investigating vulnerabilities that there's a dozen more by the time they've finished. But there are solutions. There are ways that you can make your life better here. So, I'm going to look at some variants of the Nginx image. So the first one's the official, this is what you get if you do Docker pool Nginx latest, um, and that's actually based on Debian. And if I use Quick View, it's quite nice because it also shows me like the, which layer the vulnerabilities come from. Um, but note, there's 232 packages here, which is quite a lot. Um, apparently there's one critical vulnerability, three medium and 36 low. And I can see this critical actually comes from the underlying base image. Uh, but there's apparently three medium vulnerabilities coming in from Nginx itself. Um, we can do, so that's 40 vulnerabilities in total. Um, we can look at the Alpine version, and that's a lot better. So we can see there's actually zero from the underlying base image, but apparently there's three in the Nginx layer. Also note, a lot less packages, so a lot less software in that container. And then I've got the chain guard image, uh, which you can pull at CGR at dev chain guard slash nginx, and there's zero vulnerabilities. Again, I ran this yesterday, but I suspect you'll get exactly the same results today. And also note, there's much less packages in that container. I haven't looked. We can go and look. Um, I'll kind of get into what we do in a minute. No, you're good. <laughs> so, you know, how did we get to zero vulnerabilities? Exactly to your point. Um, and actually, it's kind of weirdly simple. There's three things we did. We were really aggressive about cutting down the amount of software in an image. So in our images, we tried just to have um, packages that were required to run the application itself. 
We don't have like unneeded operating system components. Um, we're really aggressive about keeping things up to date. So we're always pulling like new releases and so on. And on top of that, we do apply patches in some cases and also issue security advisories. So on the dependencies point, just coming back to, to the, the stats, Debian, the, the Debian Nginx image had 232 packages. So that's sort of Debian components installed in it. And the majority of those aren't needed to run Nginx. Um, Alpine does much better. It has 79. I think it also one of the reasons it actually has more than Wolfie is because of the way they've um, separated out the plugins for Nginx. So that's Alpine probably in reality is a, a similar number of packages to Wolfie. Um, but one of the key points is if you're using Nginx or Debian, what happens if there's a new release of software? Um, you know, the up, upstream project will release a new version, and that has to be then picked up by Debian or Alpine, who have to create a new APK or Deb uh, and release that. And then Docker or whoever makes the image has to create an image with a new version of that package in it. And typically what you'll find is that process takes one to two weeks. Okay, so from like there being a new release upstream to that getting its software into a Docker image is one to two weeks on average. And that's one of the reasons that we created Wolfie. So Wolfie is our own, ChainGuard's own Linux distribution. Um, it's called Wolfie because ChainGuard's mascot is an octopus called Inky. Um, and Wolfie is the world's smallest octopus. Um, we couldn't call it Inky because I think some other like uh, security software is called Inky, unfortunately. And we sometimes call Wolfie an undistro. Uh, that's just because Wolfie is like a full package repository with everything built from source, but we don't package a kernel. Like we, you know, at the minute Wolfie is just designed for creating container images, and of course containers runtimes come with a, a kernel from the host. Um, Wolfie is APK and GLMC based, so APK is the Alpine package format. Um, we, however, we're not Alpine compatible. Uh, we've compiled everything from source against GLMC, so you can't mix and match Alpine and Debian packages. Uh, Wolfie is purely rolling based, so there's no, there's no point in time uh, releases, you know, there's no like Red Hat 9 equivalent, um, it's just a rolling release for, for Wolfie. All our packages come with SBOMs. Um, and we target uh, both ARM and x86-64 architectures at the minute, possibly more in the future. And we did have to come up with some of our own build tooling, um, which is open source, you can try it out yourself. Uh, there's two key components, Melange, which is what we use to build APKs. Um, it's basically a bit more pipeline oriented than the Alpine tooling. And APKO or APCO, I'm, I kind of, rotate between saying the two myself, so I'm not sure there is an official pronunciation. Uh, but what app code does, it's an equivalent of Docker build, but it's much, much simpler. Like, we don't do Docker run statements. All we do is say, you know, hey, take this bunch of APKs and create an image from them. And that's it. You can't, like, add in, you can't add in arbitrary files or anything. It has to come from an APK. So it's much more constrained than Docker build. And for that reason, it was much easier to make it reproducible. So you run an APK with build twice, you get exactly the same object out. And what that means is, because we control like, the Wolfie distribution and the building of images, if an upstream project has a new release, we can pick up that update, we can create a package for Wolfie from it, and we can release a new Docker image or container image, OCI image, for it, all like sometimes within the same hour, at least within the same day. So we've gone from one to two weeks to get an upstream fix or new release to under a day, which is a big gain for us. Um, the other thing we do uh, sometimes is apply patches. So generally you don't need to do this because the upstream will take care of it, um, but you might find upstream won't do a new release, particularly if a vulnerability is actually in a transitive dependency. So for example, you know, the project, the vulnerability is not in code the project themselves have written, it's in like a module or a library that they pull in. And so they might not do a release just to fix that. And what we do in that case is we'll pull in the project and we'll have a patch to update the dependency. Um, but of course, we're still running the same version of code as upstream. So if they're 2.02 .02 
our code's still 2.02, but the vulnerability's fixed in our version. So we need a way to tell the vulnerability scanners, okay, we are running version 2.02, but in Wolfie, we've addressed this vulnerability. And the way you do that is through something called a security advisory. Um, so to explain this, I'm going to take this report. This is running Gripe on an Alpine Redis image like months ago. So I can't remember how many months ago. But this was the results um, from the Gripe scan. At the same time, if I ran the Gripe scan on the chain guard image, you got zero vulnerabilities. I'm going to explain why that is with particular relevance to this critical vulnerability 0543. So back to the security advisories. So security advisories are just YAML files. You can go and check out our advisories at github.com slash wolfie dev slash advisories. But they basically look something like this. So we've got a package name. So this is the Redis advisory. Um, it looks similar today. There might be a few more advisories and so on. Um, but you'll see here, CVE 2022-0543, and we've marked it as fixed on a version and a timestamp. So when the scanner scans, when the scanner scanned our version of the image, it could see this and say, hey, OK, it's not vulnerable to this. But if I go and look here, because the question is, well, why didn't Alpine do that? But the thing is, the Redis image does not use Alpine to install Redis. It installed it via a Docker file that went and grabbed Redis from the, you know, the Redis server, downloaded it, and compiled it. So there was no, you know, the scanner can't go to Alpine because it's not an APK package. So there was no way for the scanner to know that this vulnerability did not affect that version of Redis. And it didn't because I think this vulnerability was something to do with Debian packaging. So there's no way this, that image was actually vulnerable. It was a false positive. But there was just no way for Docker to say, hey, this doesn't affect us. Now, in the future, that might change with stuff like VEX. But uh, yeah, at the minute, that's how things work. And why sometimes we have zero vulnerabilities when other things do show vulnerabilities. Yeah, so that's how we get to zero vulnerabilities. But the question is, OK, that's how ChainGuard does it. But what about me? Like, What about the average organization? How can they get their images to zero vulnerabilities? Um, the trite answer is, of course, use chain guard images. Um, and we do have images for lots of stuff, like Nginx, Redis, Vault, Prometheus. Um, and we also have base images. So please do go and check them out. But um, to give a better answer, um, you know, there's several things. Like cutting down dependencies, um, one of the easy things you can do is use smaller base images. Um, a very simple game can be to change to like Alpine or Debian Slim if you want to keep a, a GMC based. Uh, and that will really cut down the number of packages in your images. Uh, you can go truly minimal and use Scratch, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then there's stuff like the Google Distroless uh, base images and, of course, ChainGuard base images. Now, Scratch is the completely empty image. And that can be useful in some cases. Because if I have something like a, something like a Go program or a Rust program, I can stackily compile. I can put that into the scratch image and run it. Um, and in some cases, that will work fine. Uh, in the majority of cases, though, what you'll find is most stuff requires a few more operating system things. Um, CA certificates is the common one. So if you want to talk to anything over TLS, you're going to need CA certificates. Um, directory layouts, so a lot of applications will require or expect like slash home, slash Etsy, slash temp. Um, and users. Some applications expect a user to be defined. But what you can do is, you know, create an image that just has that and nothing more. And that's exactly what the Google, 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 Google Container Tools Distrolist project did. So they took Debian, stripped it right down, so all it had was the bare minimum you needed to run most applications. Um, it's smaller than Debian and Alpine. It's, I think it's about two or three megabytes. It doesn't include a package manager or shell by default. Um, but there's a limited number of images. There's like a base image for, using, for working with static binaries. Um, there's also like a Java version, and I think there's a, a Python version. Um, but there's not much more than that. The other thing is it's quite hard to extend. Because what you would like to do is say, 
OK, this is based on Debian. I just want to stick another dev file in there that my application needs. But that's actually quite tricky, and you'll find yourself playing with Bazel or Basil. And um, yeah, that's not my idea of fun, although <laughs> other people do like it. Um, and then you have ChainGuard base images. So ChainGuard was founded by, or amongst others, Matt Moore and Dan Lawrence. And they were actually the people that also started Google Container Tools DistroList. So there's a direct lineage to the ChainGuard base images. Um, and the major difference, really, is that our images are a bit easier to extend and customize. So you can use our tools, like APKO, but you can also just use straight Docker files and so on. Um, yeah, our images also come with SBOMs and are continuously updated and based on glibc. The other thing you should look at doing is trying to cut down your dependencies. So if you're not doing it already, look at using multi-stage builds. So you've got like, um, so you don't end up with all your build tooling in your production image. So for example, if you've got a Java application, they'll use a JDK image to compile it, but then copy the jar over to a, a, a JRE image, which will be much lighter. Uh, and similarly, like, uh, try not to have dev or debug dependencies in your final production image. Also, if you can, just pull in less, li less libraries. Like, if you pull in a library to make one function call, think about if you can you know, not to do that. Because every time you pull in a library, you've got to try and keep that library up to date, or it might end up getting you compromised, right? I do know that's a lot easier say to, to say than it is to do. The other thing is to keep updated. And this is probably the critical one. And I think where most people fall down. Um, a simple way to do that is to use some tooling like Dependabot that will keep telling you there's new versions of stuff available. Um, Google also have this concept of build horizon, which I quite like. And the idea is that all software needs to be continually rebuilt and redeployed. So even if my application um, hasn't changed in the last six months, I shouldn't be running the container for six months, right? I should be like taking it down and replacing it with a new version, because although the application code hasn't changed, the dependencies and other stuff in the image will have. So at Google, they apparently, um, you know, every image is updated or refreshed every week, I, th I believe. OK, so in summary, please try and use better images and better base images, and check out ChainGuard. Um, be aggressive about reducing dependencies. Don't run more software than you need to. Um, keep your software updated. Again, I really think that's the key point that people need to get to. Because sometimes you don't want to update, right? Because we're scared to update because sometimes things break. But uh, the tension is if you don't update, you end up getting compromised. So do try and be aggressive about keeping stuff up to date. And if you do all that, you can get to zero vulnerabilities. OK, thank you very much. Any question from? Oh, a lot of questions. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious when it comes to the patching. Um, so you all have engineers there who are patching all these random packages. How do you all manage that? It seems really hard to you know go into a random piece of software and and update it. Right. So we generally won't write our own patches. We might like update a, a library or something, um, but. And we do have patch files, but what you'll generally find is that patch will be taken from like a GitHub PR or something. So it's, it's pretty rare that we have to write our own patches. Like we're not experts in all the software yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So I think it's your point. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had similar question, but like uh, yeah, yeah. Like that's is it sustainable? Like you know, it's it's too much catch up to play with so many softwares out there. How do you decide what to keep patched up? and what to ignore and, you know? So we run like, uh, we use gripe internally. So that we have basically that running on our like images or in our packages continuously. And so that kind of tells us what we need to look at all the time. Um, I hope it's sustainable because it keeps me in a job. <laughs> I agree. And just one more thing. The, the database that you showed about like uh, when it was patched and like who maintains that, how it's, how it's curated, where, where is the, the data? advisory coming? stuff? Yeah, yeah, advisory. Yeah. yeah, so we have a tool, Wolfie CTL, and we just like you know type Wolfie CTL and then the package, and it, lot, it fills out the information automatically. So that date is just like when we updated it, basically. 
Because we were never, like the vulnerability I showed, we were never vulnerable to. Right? But that date is just when we said we weren't vulnerable to it. So the, the universe of software that someone might want to run um, is enormous. Uh, NixOS has something on the order of about 50,000 packages that they derive things from. Uh, how big is the Wolfie universe of thing of containers that you can reasonably expect to have uh, zero known defects of? And like in practice, how much does that constrain development because you're working in not the complete universe of software, but a smaller known universe? Um, so we can look at, oh, maybe I can't. I was going to try and bring up the terminal. Can they come out of here? Hmm. Where's my terminal not showing? Oh, I can show you in a minute um, how many like packages there are in um, Wolfie, but it's you know it's all very fairly big. It's certainly not the size of Debian, and nowhere near like NixOS, which NixOS is like uh, enormous. But NixOS it's also not very updated. It's the problem. You quite often find things are broken or out of date. Um, of course, we'd, we'll try, the patches we add are generally in direct response to customer requests. Um, we are also, you know, Wolfie is very much an open source and community-based distribution. Um, so for instance, you know, we're moving to open tofu, for example. Um, we may keep a separate repo for uh, differently licensed stuff that our customers request. Um, but yeah. That, does that answer the question? I think that is. I think that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a lot of. Uh, I have. So you mentioned that chain guard images will sometimes patch upstream code in the image itself. I'm wondering. So, so like proto, the protobuf package dependencies are notorious for introducing um, incompatibilities in patch versions, and I'm just thinking in terms of package reproducibility. Um, if ChainGuard is changing to a more recent upstream patch on an underlying transitive dependency, mm -hmm. that could introduce incompatibilities that your unit tests in your you know development stage didn't didn't catch because you know your image has actually patched it out of band from your reproducible build in CI/CD. Have you have you seen you know in the community these problems manifest themselves in any way and? And is that something that you guys are concerned about? I've not seen that. I think what you're saying is basically when we patch things, you know, well, we've changed something, and that could break people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't, you don't, your, your your build might be reproducible, right? But the unit tests are operating on a different version of of the actual. Yeah, yeah, right. Of the actual patch. We're not right? running the upstream tests. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we might in some cases. For example, I think we run the Java ones, but. Uh, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and what I would say to you is, we tell our customers to like run a digest when they pull an image, so they always get exactly the same version of the image. And then if something breaks, um, when you do an update, you can roll back to exactly the, the, the old version that worked before. Um, but again, it comes down to that point about being aggressive about updating versus like uh, you know reliability when sticking on things. It's uh, yeah. Um, why didn't Dan and those folks build Wolfie in Google then? That's Dan, I guess they probably <laughs> wanted to. Um, I would say, however, like, uh, I do have a big shout out for Ariadne. So like Ariadne Connell is the person that's behind Wolfie. Uh, and she had all the experience from working on Alpine. Uh, and that's why we use APK really. And you know, without Ariadne, this wouldn't exist. Yeah. So maybe the answer is he didn't have Ariadne. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that, that would be, so, so uh, I mean, uh, I, I would argue that yeah. you do more because you can't really make that. Yeah. No. Hey, Adrian, uh, great talk. 
So one question is like there are multiple packages and you know multiple uh, CV fixes keeps on coming. So how do you, you know there are there are sometimes there are no fixes available from the upstream. So how are you handling that? I'm not sure entirely. Like most of the time, we just want to be pulling the upstream latest release. Okay. And the only time we'll patch it is if like there's a vulnerability and the upstream isn't doing a release. But then the upstream will do a release and we'll you know we won't be doing the patch anymore. Does that answer the question? Though? Yeah, like. It doesn't exactly solve the zero vulnerability in the images, right? For example, I have. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, there will be at the minute like uh, multi uh, packages with vulnerabilities. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure which ones. So you do have to dig a bit to find them. Thank you. Uh, uh, like nginx, I think is a popular uh, application, but and probably. It, it it would make sense that the Nginx project itself releases these artifacts now. I mean, what do you mean? As in, like an artifact? before before uh, like the container images, for example. Why why is there a wait between uh, it coming to a package and then that package used uh, package is then used for building images? But then there's a question about what base should Nginx use for their images. Whatever is the basic minimal, no? Like, isn't that how it should be? So we're, like, we compile Nginx from source, uh -huh. um, and we do it for like a couple of architectures, and we do it on top of our base system. But you know, other people will want a Red Hat base image, and other organizations want uh, an Alpine base image, and that needs to be compiled against Muzzle. So there's all these different um, requirements, basically. And some people don't want an image at all; they just want to run Nginx. So I mean, some projects definitely do do Docker releases. I'm not really sure why Nginx doesn't, but in general, I guess it's just a separation of concerns. Okay, thank you. So, last question. Quick question. You might know, maybe not, uh, about the image composition um, and the use of hard links and soft links. For example, uh, bin shell is a soft link, at least with the image I'm dealing with, is a soft link to an absolute path bin busy box where for example, BusyBox, they use hard links. So do you know much about the use of hard links versus soft links in, in your images? I'm not really. I'm sure this like was a, did you open a PR or an issue on this? Or talk to Ariadne or something? I'm sure I saw this in Slack at one point. It's not quite uh, an issue. It's, it's related to an image uh, that you guys created for, for Slim Toolkit. You created Slim Toolkit I debug image. I did see this. And I, I, you know, I tried to you know, test it and all of that, and I came across a few gotchas. And do I, I don't know the exact reason, to be honest. Uh, we can, I'll we'll look that up later, though. Sure. OK. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we'll be back in four minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.